Our scripture reading for today is Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before his shearer, so he does not open his word. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch said, asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him, the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch asked, look, here's water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So, I had more questions than answers. It seems appropriate today's scripture, to, or today's scripture is both about asking questions and creates more questions. Like, who's Philip and where did he come from? Why don't we all get angels that tell us what to do and where to go when we wake up in the morning? And how many African eunuchs have copies of Isaiah as they travel around the world in those days? Last week we heard about Stephen and others being appointed to feed the poor so that the disciples could keep about the work of proclaiming the gospel, teaching, and prayer. Philip was one of those others appointed to feed people. And here's our second story in a row of one of those people not feeding people, but out proclaiming the gospel. Today we get to hear about Philip, sent by God to a eunuch from Ethiopia, a servant of the queen. So we know a couple of things about the identity of this person. They're described as a eunuch and they're described as Ethiopian. Eunuch probably suggests they were a castrated man, which could happen for many reasons in that time and place in the world. Some cultures use this as a punishment for people who had committed a crime. Some used it as a punishment if they were not open to diverse identities within their community. Other people used it as a job requirement. If you would like to serve in the royal court, you needed to become a eunuch. That way, you might not put your family obligations ahead of the monarchy. You wouldn't try to create power to bump them off and put your family in charge. You would have a clear mind because you wouldn't be clouded by other things. Some of these jobs included bathing, the king or queen, cutting their hair, bringing them documents. Many of these folks became diplomats or oversaw money. 
They didn't have families to go home to usually, so they worked long hours. It was a really good deal for those in power. Sometimes it was a natural occurrence. It might be someone today that we would describe as intersex or asexual. It might have been a physical dysfunction, and so they were described as a eunuch. We don't know, and in this instance, it really doesn't matter. None of us are building a relationship with this person, right? What we do know is the queen gave them trust and responsibility. So who cares about the rest? Now the other description, Ethiopian, at least that's what the English translation says. And I'll be honest, it's also what the Greek and Latin say. So why am I wasting your time on something that history has no disagreement on? Because the Greek word for Ethiopian is a compound word from two Greek words that mean burnt face. Let that settle in for a second. A little digging shows us that Kush, which archaeologists have told us is part of the, that cradle of civilization, that there were empires that rose and grew and changed and shifted, but really from northern Sudan, just south of Egypt, all the way down along the African eastern coast towards Yemen and the Arabian Peninsula, where they almost meet, all along the Red Sea there. They were a rival of Egypt. They often had cultural transference between them, and at one point some of Egypt's mythology crept in so much that the monarchies further south went up and destroyed many of the Egyptian temples to clean out their power from their people. This was a major nation. And along the way, women rose to power and were allowed to serve as monarchs. They were rivals of Egypt, not subservient to them. And I doubt any of them referred to themselves as burnt faced. But history is filled with unfortunate stories like this, isn't it? How often has one culture imposed its reality and left others stuck? How often has one community dictated another community's identity? It's Pride Month, and we're recognizing Juneteenth on a day where our scripture story is about an ambiguously asexual person being called a burnt face. Yeah, and you thought I was going to preach about a conversion story. Tomorrow is Juneteenth, a heartbreaking celebration of those in Texas finally discovering that they were emancipated. Two years after the proclamation. News traveled slower back then, but not that slow. It was news that was not delivered. It was justice denied intentionally. And we know that over the years, similar discriminations took place. Laws were created to quickly criminalize poverty so that those who were people of color who had been set free would find themselves incarcerated and a part of another enslaved system. We know that even within the structures of our government, systems were put in place to keep African-American families from achieving home ownership. Our federal bodies built to help people get home ownership actually wrote in that neighborhoods are more stable when they stay the same economically and ethnically. So they would deny home loans to black families for the stability of neighborhoods. It was systemic. It was in their policies. And even after the end of slavery, We've seen power dictate a servant identity on those who were supposedly free. Those in power imposed new rules to make sure those who were free were still stuck. Today's story is fascinating. The servant of an African queen has traveled to Jerusalem to worship. To worship. He's not stuck where he's from. He's a person of authority. The power and privilege what assumptions do we make about the eunuch from Africa as we hear that story? 
What assumptions did Philip make? Remember, they weren't big on Gentiles becoming Christian yet. That's still being fought over. A couple chapters later, we'll get to more of that. You can come back the next two weeks and we'll cover it. In today's story, the servant of an African queen travels to Jerusalem to worship. Who? Who is he worshiping? God? The man has a scroll of Isaiah, presumably in Hebrew. How? They weren't just running copies of those down at the staples in Jerusalem. There were very few handwritten copies. You had to be a learned person to have a copy. Things were just being put from the oral tradition into written tradition in this area of history. And why does he have it? Is he already familiar with the Jewish tradition? There are stories of Jewish communities in Africa, south of Egypt. And years later, when the Ethiopian Christian church grows, they become more aware and tell more of the stories of these Jewish communities. Some say that the queen of Sheba, who ruled over Cush and Egypt, brought her son with Solomon back home and brought Judaism with them. Some say along with the ark, but Indiana Jones has not proven that to be true yet. So we don't know. Others say that refugees came from Egypt, that slaves left Egypt long before Moses set the masses free. And they would have come down the Nile and then down into those areas along the coast and created pockets of communities, of ethnic communities. Some point out that these are also major trade routes, so there was always sharing. People always talking about their story, their faith, their family, their culture. There was exchange in this part of the world. However he arrives on this road from Jerusalem to Gaza, this traveler from the south has a relationship with God of some kind. Whether he has been taught Judaism from a pocket back home, whether he is a scholar on behalf of the queen doing a cultural exchange, going up to worship this God and to learn more, or whether he is just a curious mind and soul that wants to learn and grow, Philip is sent to this person, again, even though teaching is not his commission. Philip's appointed to feed people, not evangelize or convert. Yet here we are. One wants to learn and opens his chariot and heart to another, even though that person calls him an asexual burnt face. One has been sent by God, so he takes the risk of talking to someone else that his people tell him is another. He even baptizes him, even though he has no permission to do so yet. It's a strange moment where one person lets a person from another culture who is oppressive and probably rude or discriminatory, discriminatory in their speech to them into their chariot in order to learn from them. And where someone else steps into a space they're told they do not belong and should not go in order to teach and share what they know. Larner shows Philip the scripture he's reading. It's the story of the suffering servant from Isaiah 53. Larner asks, who does the prophet say this is about? And this is fascinating. Philip ignores the question. He said, the learner asks, who does the prophet say this is about? And in a tactic most often seen by politicians and parents, Philip ignores the premise of the question. If you want to know what ignoring the premise of a question looks like, think about a parent who's asked, where do babies come from? And the parent responds, would you like ice cream? They ignore the premise of the question and move on with something else. And we handle it just fine, right? Politicians do it this way. I know you're running for office, so what do you believe about the death penalty? And the politician answers, let me tell you a story about my uncle. The learner, who does the prophet say this is about? Well, historically, some have said Isaiah was writing about Moses. Some say the nation of Israel. It was a metaphor for the whole nation. Some say Isaiah was referring to the Messiah still to come. 
In some areas of Isaiah, Isaiah identifies the Messiah that they're talking about, showing us that Isaiah never thought it was just one person, that a Messiah, a Savior, is someone that God sends at different times in history. At one point, Isaiah says, I'm talking about Cyrus of the Persians who came and set them free from Babylon. But at this point, the prophet doesn't say. The prophet's ambiguous. So Philip steps in with his own answer. Since Isaiah is ambiguous, Philip says, let me tell you about Jesus. The learner is inspired. The learner is moved. And they ask to get baptized at the next sign of water. Philip is good at this stuff. Or the learner has already done a lot of work. There is a student ready to learn and grow. There's a teacher and a mentor ready to share. And they came together. As unlikely as they may have been, as unhealthy as the dynamic might have been. There is a student ready to learn and grow, and there is a teacher ready to share and support. So who in your life has been there? Ready to meet your curiosity with their wisdom. In your life, when have you wanted to learn and someone was there to teach? When have you had questions and someone was there to help you ask a better question? Ready to meet you, to challenge you and support you. That's really the important things about good teachers and mentors. They don't just puff us up, they challenge us. And they also support us. They do both at the same time. Who has been your great mentor? Mentors. They may have been totally patronizing to you, but still a good mentor. They may have been racist, sexist, selfish, but somehow still a good mentor. They may have been carrying their own baggage. They may have had some work to do on themselves, but for you they were the right teacher and guide at that time and place. Who has looked to you for guidance and support? You may not have felt equipped, you may not have wanted the job, and you may have felt like you completely fumbled it when you received it. You may have felt like you were a hot mess and no one should listen to what you said, yet God put you in someone's path. You may not have been led by an angel in a dream, but your gut got you there. Circumstance got you there. Maybe they thought you knew more than you did. Maybe they thought you were their only hope. Maybe they thought you were an undesirable based on their culture or politics, but God had put you in their path. Why? Who knows? We quit trying to figure out why God sticks us in each other's paths. We quit trying to figure out how our relationships form and why these messy entanglements of community show such beauty. Random encounters can become life changers. The person you bump into the store can become a friend. The person you sit next to in a class can become a lifelong companion. The teacher or coach might become a mentor. The neighbor or coworker might become a guide on the next chapter of your life, or you might become theirs. When we move past our assumptions of each other, when we move past the roles we have imposed or others have imposed upon us, when we move past our fears and insecurities about each other, we find ourselves in chariots with strangers. We find ourselves in conversations with people who see us as other. We find ourselves in positions to ask questions and offer better questions. We find ourselves sharing stories and hearing stories across cultures, across different experiences of life. We find ourselves in position to tell what God is like to us and hear what God is like to others. To be challenged and be supported. We find ourselves in a place to be challenged and supported. We challenge those who don't know and thus act out of ignorance. We challenge them to learn. That's why we have a Juneteenth holiday, right? It's not because it was such a celebratory moment. It's because it's such an embarrassing moment in history that we can't forget it. 
We challenge ourselves to do better. And then we support each other about the work. We keep telling each other, hey, I'm glad you mentioned that because what you said is a great example of systemic racism. Let's talk about it. I'm glad you brought up reparations. I'm glad you brought up mental health disparity. I'm glad you brought up infant and mother mortality rates in healthcare. I'm glad you brought up these places. We don't assume racism has trickled in, but we can see it if we look. We support each other as we go about the lifelong work of undoing the oppressive imposing of the past. We find ourselves in position to share stories and hear stories, to challenge and support. We challenge what we've been told because we do that. And we support each other in growing and becoming. We challenge the limitations that people put on us and we support each other's discovery of what we might become. We challenge what was. We challenge what was. Even while we celebrate the intentions in it, even when we celebrate the good that comes along the way, we challenge what was. And then we support each other through what is. We challenge what was. We support each other on what is and we support each other in all that we might become. Amen. Thank you.